to you tonight, and we ask, Lord, that you would teach us from your word how David spoke so vividly to you, and we want to do the same. And we want to learn from him and see the things that he did and let us find a pattern there, Lord, that when we pray that you will acknowledge our prayers, you will hear our prayers and be with us. In Jesus' holy name we pray, amen. All right, we're starting in Psalms 31st chapter, <clears throat> the first verse. We're going to find some interesting things as a psalmist praise to God. We're going to find him acknowledging the benefits of trusting in God. He lists reasons and benefits for praying with faith to the Lord. First, he knows that we'll never be ashamed. The Bible teaches us over and over again that at the end of time, those who know Jesus Christ as their Savior will not be confounded nor be ashamed. The Lord is stronger than any fortress sanctuary here on this earth. He's the rock of ages. Our soul will deliver to God pure, spotless, safe by the blood of the Lamb. He has given us the Holy Spirit and His Word to lead and guide us. Another amazing benefit, no matter how bad the trouble, I can rejoice that all is well with my soul. For his name, my name, is written in the Lamb's Book of Life. Another major benefit, we can express how desperate, how desperate, desolate we believe things to be. We can really call it like we think it is. We don't have to sugarcoat it. We don't have to come up with flower crazies. If we think we're in a desperate plight, go ahead and tell him, because that's what the psalmist did. With our desperate attempt to convince God how bad we have it, we can also confess that we recognize he is our only hope for a solution. And our advice to all people in trouble and prosperity is love the Lord, trust the word, and be of good courage. So tonight he talks about listing the many benefits of trusting God in prayer. And in trouble, he said, I can rejoice for all is well with my soul. We don't have to hold back. You know, we try to come up with some kind of cute sayings and stuff, but just tell the Lord like it is. Explain to God how bad things really are. And finally, he, he bumps around all over the place. He goes back and forth. He's acknowledged our only hope is to put our trust in God. He confident, conf confidently expresses faith that God will hear us and act. And then he says, the only thing to do, friends, is to love the Lord and be of good courage. What are some benefits of loving the Lord? Trusting Him. What are some benefits? We have eternal life. We have comfort and peace. He'll never leave us nor forsake us. So David begins to extol some of the benefits. In the 31st chapter of Psalms, the first verse, he says, In thee, O Lord, do I put my trust. Let me never be ashamed. Deliver me in thy righteousness. The Bible tells us over and over again, those that trust in the Lord will not be ashamed. And we will deliver through Jesus' blood and righteousness. Romans 9, 33 says, As it is written, Behold, I lay in Zion a stumbling stone and rock of offense. And whosoever believeth on him shall not be ashamed. So we find that it's said over and over in the Bible that we'll not be ashamed. But when someone is dying and you can hardly hear what they're saying, what do you do? They're on the deathbed and you walk in and they, they just can get a little whisper. What will you do? You put your ear down our clothes, right? So he's saying, Lord, come close. Put your ear down here close to my lips. Make sure you can hear me. <clears throat> he says, bow down thine ear to me. Deliver me speedily. Be thou my strong rock for a house of defense to save me. 
be straight to the point. No flowery phases, phrases. Like someone is dying, he says, put your ear next to my lips so you can hear me clearly everything I say. Well, he says, you, I can't give you a date and time. I can't give God a date and time. I guess we can, but he didn't do that. He says, deliver me speedily, but request his problem to be taken care of speedily. He didn't give him a date and time. I trust in you because I know you are my rock and my strength. There are many places in that area where they depend on high rocky places. You know, you see in the westerns, uh, cowboys get up on top of the hill and rocks and hide. Well, that's the way it is in that country over there. They have a lot of high places where they get behind rocks and, and be uh, safe. But he says, I don't depend on that. I depend on the rock of my strength, God. And that is what is asking God to be like, like those high rocky places. He says, For thou art my rock and my fortress. Therefore, for thy name's sake, lead me and guide me. Well, we, we've heard this before where someone said that you need to do these for thy name's sake. We're in, we're in the book of Psalms. Have you heard that before? For thy name's sake. It's one of the most popular psalms of all. It's the 23rd Psalm. And he says, He restoreth my soul. He leadeth me in paths of righteousness for his name's sake. He acknowledges that the only real defense is with God. Now, where can I go and hide that would even be good as a protection that God can provide? And if you're God, lead me, guide me, so that people know that I'm a Christian and know that you're supposed to protect your own. So I want you to do that, to show them that's what he's talking about there. And then he says, you know, people set all kinds of traps for us as Christians. And he says, get me out of all those traps. Pull me out of the net that they have laid privately for me, for thou art my strength. Keep me from all the traps that are set for me. For thou art my strength. In Ecclesiastes 9, 12, it says, For man also knoweth not his time, as the fishes that are taken in the evil net, and as the birds that are caught in the snare, so are the sons of men snared in an evil time when it falleth suddenly upon them. Why, why, we're not to be surprised when evil things come upon us. One of the things that people think, well, I'm so good, why did this happen to me? Why did God let this happen to me? But the Bible said, don't be surprised when things come upon you. And then he says, into thy hand I commit my spirit. Thou hast redeemed me, O Lord, God of truth. Now, there was, this was said somewhere else in the New Testament. A similar statement like this. Do you remember who said that? Starts with a big J. His name was Jesus. In Luke 23, 46, And when Jesus had cried with a loud voice, he said, Father, into thy hands I commend my spirit. And having said thus, he gave up the ghost. Whether we live or die, the best thing we can do is commend our spirit into the hands. For it is God that has redeemed us through his son Jesus. And you have said that my soul will be saved. And you are a God that cannot lie. So I claim this promise. Now, a lot of people are taken up with vanities. What are vanities? What are some vanities in this world? Well, what did Ecclesiastes, Song of Solomon said about the world? He said, I've tried everything in the world and they're all vanities. So everything in this world is a vanity and a lot of people get caught up in them. The big house, the big car, all these other things that they want. And he says, I haven't done that. He said, I've hated the vanities. I've hated them that regard lying vanities but I trust in the Lord. He said, I'm not put my trust in the things of this earth. 
that are calling out to me. For well, all these things call out to us, as I've said before, I've been in places where they have these six and eight and ten million dollar homes and people have helicopters and land in their backyard and you look, my goodness, he says, they're calling out. You know, you feel a little, little bit of envy and you go in these houses that have room after room after room after room and you just look at them. You, you just kind of want a little bit. But he says, that I know that all is vanity and all of it will perish. You have made me to see the only real trust can be in you, O Lord. And that's what I'm doing. Well, in trouble, he says, I can rejoice. Isn't that a wonderful spirit? In trouble, I can rejoice, for all is well with my soul. He says, I will be glad and rejoice in thy mercy, for thou hast considered my trouble, thou hast known my soul in adversities. adversities. I have no reason to fear. I will rejoice because thou hast been with me in many a battle against evil and had mercy on me and delivered me. And you haven't delivered me into the hands of my enemy. Who is our greatest enemy? Starts with a big S, but I always give him a little less. Satan. Satan. He is our biggest enemy. And it says, in our battle against Satan, you've given me eternal life. So you've not delivered me in the hands of my enemy. And then he says, I am really in big trouble. Have mercy upon me, O Lord, for I am troubled. Mine eye is consumed with grief, yea, my soul and my belly. And he, he said, I just can't really express how grief-stricken I am. And I'm consumed with grief, my soul and my body. I am completely consumed with grief. And he says, for my life is spent with grief, and my years were sighing. My strength faileth because of mine iniquity, and my bones are consumed. I spend all of my time because of my sin. I spend all of my time in sorrow. I am reduced to a failing old man. My bones are consumed in sin. What do enemies do when they see our enemies see us go down? What do they think they do? Rejoice. They rejoice. They delight. And he says, this is what's happening. I'm having a terrible time. And my enemies over there just rejoicing and joking and looking at me. He says, I was a reproach among all my enemies, but especially among my neighbors. And a fear to mine acquaintances that they did see me without fled from me. And he says, when they think that I'm that God is not with me, they flee. Well, you know, a lot of people are what we call fair weather friends. friends. You know, if you got something going, they're right there with you. But you know, when you're in downspout, they don't have anything to do with you. He says, my enemies were glad to see me in such an estate. Even my neighbors did not want to be seen with me because of my troubles. And we had someone else who fled in a time of need. Do you remember who fled? <coughs> you remember who fled? Something happened when they crucified Jesus. All of his disciples fled from him. And says, my enemies were glad to see me in such a state. He says, I might as well be dead for all the good I'm doing. I am forgotten as a dead man out of my mind. I'm like a broken vessel. He says, you know, when you have a, I got an old bucket that's broken. It's got a bottom out of it. It's not much use for anything. But throw it away. And he says, uh, I don't think we're going to get any good out of these dead people out here either. He says, for all practical purposes, I just might as well be dead. No one has any use for me like I was dead or a broken vase. When we are of no use, the fair weather friends, friends flee. Now they begin to lie about him. And we know that people do that. 
and they the gossiping we play this little game where gossiping one starts at one end and tells another 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 and one on the other end tells what was supposed to be said well that's sort of like gossip I said I'm not real sure of this but I think and then they're off, off and running so I see that I heard that this morning at the head table at King Kitchen <laughs> I'm not real sure of this but I believe and so he says for I've heard the slander of many Fear was on every side. While they took counsel together against me, they devised to take away my life. Well, this is also uh, talking about Jesus again. Because they were all against him. They trumped up the charges and they wanted to kill him. When Jesus was tried, they trumped up the charges. They lied. They took counsel to take his life. Well, finally, he gets around on all of this, acknowledging the real reason that he comes to God. Acknowledging our only hope. But I trusted in thee, O Lord. Thou art my God. No matter how life was going, one thing that never changed and never should change in our life is our trust in God. O Lord, thou art our God. And then he says, I, I give my, put myself in your hands. The only place we need to put ourselves is the hands of God. He says, my times are in thy hands. Deliver me from the hand of mine enemies and from them that persecute me. Now, there was a similar statement like this made by Jesus, but not exactly. He says, if thou will let this cup pass from me, but not my will, but thy will be done. And so he's asking for all of these things to be taken away from him. And of course we ask for that too from time to time, but in all cases it cannot be. And then he says, let me know you're happy with me. Isn't it good if we knew that God says, yeah, I'm happy with you. He says, make thy face to shine upon thy servant. Save me for thy mercy's sake. Let me know that you're happy with my actions and come what will. I know that all is well with my soul. And then I don't want to be ashamed. He said, I don't want to be one of those that's going to be ashamed. He said, let me not be ashamed, O Lord, for I call upon thee. Let the wicked be ashamed. Let them be silent in the grave. Well, he says, the best place for the wicked is where? in the grave he says put them in the grave cut them off he said and then he says in the next verse let the lying lips be put to silence which speak grievous things proudly and contemptuously against the righteous make them see the error of their ways and wouldn't that be great it's going to happen someday but it'd be nice to have it happen now where the people out there that are not christians could see the error of their ways they so proudly proclaim all of this other stuff except Jesus there against God. How they make fun of someone following you, Lord, and keep them silent until they die. So we find that uh, he begins to acknowledge how great is God's goodness. How great is thy goodness. And we know that he sent Jesus Christ to die on the cross. What great goodness that is. Which thou hast laid up for them that fear thee. Which thou hast wrought for them that trust in thee. Before the sons of men. Having gone through all the blessings that God provides us with. He begins to praise the Lord. Even though he was in great distress. He begins to be filled with praise and joy. That's one of the things that we've encouraged people to. And the Bible encouraged us to do. In times of trouble, go ahead and begin to praise the Lord, and it will help lift our spirits. Thou shalt hide them in the secret of thy presence from the pride of man. Thou shalt keep them secretly in a pavilion from the strife of tongues. So full of the Holy Spirit will not be tempted to be proud or prideful. We are a proud people because we've done certain things, but he says, Fill me with the Holy Spirit that I walk in humility. 
not be tempted by the tongues of others. Because some, then we find that in the media back and forth where they praise each other and each of them are proud of the fact that they've done whatever they've done. But we know the only important thing is that they know Jesus Christ as their Savior. And again, he said, Blessed be the Lord. Praise the Lord, for he has showed me his marvelous kindness in a strong city. God has revealed his love and kindness in Jesus. And we're safer there than in a fortified position here on earth than any foxhole we can dig as a soldier. For I said in my haste, I am cut off from before thine eyes. Nevertheless, thou heardest the voice of my supplication when I cried unto you. He says, I was a little bit hasty when I began to uh, think that I was cut off from you because I never am. And even though I was sure you had abandoned me, I was wrong. You have heard my cries. And the only thing to do, friends, is love the Lord and be of good courage. He says, Oh, love the Lord, all ye his saints, for the Lord preserveth the faithful and plentifully rewardeth the proud doer. Love the Lord and follow his precepts faithfully, and we find that all things happen for the good of them to those who love the Lord and are called according to his purpose. Of course, we know that he asks us to be of good courage. Then who else asks us that? Remember in the Old Testament, someone else says be of good courage. That was when uh, the one took over for Moses. He says, be of good courage. But he encourages us tonight, or the command is for us to be of good courage, and he shall strengthen your heart. All you that hope in the Lord, that they be of good courage, for he was the same God that was good to him, and he knew God would be good to us, and be good to us as he was to him. Again, he listed many of the benefits of praying and trusting in God and in trouble we don't have to be worried but for all is well with our soul and we don't have to hold back and explain to God how we feel a lot of people are afraid to do that but David was not he explained to God how he felt how he felt deserted and all those things and then he comes back and says well I was a little bit hasty I shouldn't have done all that it says he begins to acknowledge that our only hope is to put our trust in God. And so the only thing to do, friends, is to love the Lord, trust in Him, and be of good courage. Let us pray. And most gracious Heavenly Father, we thank you for tonight. We thank you for what David does and how he leads us to come to you about everything, to acknowledge how we feel. Sometimes we feel forsaken, even as he did, but we have to get back to acknowledging that you will never leave us nor forsake us. And again, Lord, we praise you for the many wonderful things you've done in our life. And we ask again, Lord, that you just be with us as we go and come again. Keep us safe. Help us to continue to trust you and to walk in faith. In Jesus' holy name we pray. Amen.